So Paul, throughout my career, people have been talking about the cosmic microwave background. And it was always this thing that held great promise to change the way we understand cosmology. And since about 1998, those dreams have really come true. Uh, it already had won uh, two Nobel Prizes worth, it turns out, by 1998, although they weren't awarded until the second one until 2005. But it's worth to go back uh, and think about this cosmic microwave background and how it can change our understanding of cosmology because it turns out to be this beautiful experiment, exquisite experiment in space using physics we can understand here on Earth. So what is the microwave background? Uh, this is a video we showed in the first course. But the basic idea is when the universe is very young, you've got particles, protons and electrons, baryons if you like, and they're all ionized. Electrons have been split off from the protons and the neutrons. And you've got photons, which at this point are quite the energy, guys, green yeah. ones over here. And these are all bound together because as the atoms, the protons and neutrons are ionized, the photons can't get past them and bounce off. So you've actually got what's say, a, a baryon-photon fluid. The two are coupled together. But as time goes on, the whole thing is expanding. Um, and eventually, as just happened there, it becomes sufficiently cool that the electrons can combine with the protons and the neutrons and form neutron atoms. And at that point, they become transparent. They no longer interact with the photons. And the photons have been flying free ever since that time. And so we have this time when the photons are bouncing from baryon to baryon. That's like a fog. That's an analogy to having a fog everywhere because the photons can't travel in straight lines. And then suddenly the universe recombines, the baryons recombine, mm -hmm. and voila, the fog is suddenly lifted on the universe. And it goes transparent. And so here's, we get very early on, there are actually a billion photons for every baryon. That's because originally there was a mixture of matter and antimatter, and most of it annihilated, leaving only one part and a billion left over. So I've grossly underestimated the number of photons for every baryon over here. And we have no idea why that happened. That's one of the big mysteries of the universe. And that's something we talked about in the first course in the yeah. series. Uh, but as things slowly cool down, this glowing fog is still in a glowing fog, getting cooler and cooler, and suddenly it becomes transparent. But you can see once it became transparent, all these photons are released, and they're still flying randomly in every direction through space. And in fact, they're still raining down on us in huge numbers on Earth today. And this is a cosmic microwave background, picked up by radio astronomers back in the 1960s. And it's sort of like driving out of a fog bank and being able to look back at the fog bank, and you get to see exactly what's going on on that surface of that fog bank. Yep, so if we look out in any direction, at, uh, uh, we'll see this fog bank in the distance, yep. and we can do an image of it across the entire sky, and here's what it looks like. So this is what it looked like in 1964, uh, and in case you're looking for some detail there, this is the entire sky looking exactly the same. It really was just a, uh, a radio waves coming from all directions on the sky with equal intensity. Yes, so not exactly the most interesting picture in astronomy. Uh, no. However, as time went on, people got more <coughs> precise measurements, and they were able to discover that if they looked in great detail, it wasn't completely uniform. There was a rather slight pattern to it, and here's that pattern. Okay, so let's do the little thing right through the center. You've plotted this such that the galaxy goes right through the center. Yes. So you can see there's some messy stuff, and one would expect there to be radio waves emitting at this frequency from stuff in the galaxy through synchrotron radiation. That's so right. we can understand at least that part of it. But it's not the strongest thing. The strongest no. source is up here, not in the plane of the galaxy. What's well, that? it's not just a source. It's like there is, it's, it's oh, higher not. frequency here and lower frequency there. And it's, it's a giant curve. And if you plot what this looks like, and I were to plot a line of intensity from here to here, it would look like a perfect cosine. So a perfect that? cosine. What's going on here? That well, so the Doppler shift, if you think about it, is going to redshift or blue shift light. And if you're going at some direction to that, then there's going to be a cosine. So maybe it's that. We're moving uh, that direction towards the, well, so that's the cool spot. I get confused. It's blue shifted. Uh, we're moving the direction of the blue shift and have the redshift to the ways behind us. So imagine we were moving at 680 kilometers per second in that direction, then you might be able to explain exactly what we see here. 
yes, it's in some sense like you know, driving down a road in the rain. The rain's hitting the front of your, even though the rain's falling vertically, it seems to hit you much harder from the front than the back. That's because you're moving into it. We are moving through the sea of particles. This is in part due to the motion of the Earth around the galaxy, part due to the motion of the galaxy around the Andromeda, part due to the fall of all of that into the Virgo cluster, and part the motion of us and the Virgo cluster towards something called the Great Attractor. So right. this is the overall motion of us regard to anything, 680 kilometers per second. Um, so, okay, well that's taught us something quite neat. It's how we're moving against the, the microwave background. That's the closest thing we have to an absolute standard of motion. Well, it really is like an absolute frame of reference. Something I was always told we wouldn't have, but we, the way the universe is constructed, we sort of do. Yeah. Anyway, let's take that out. So let's take out, this is called the dipole. So let's take yeah. that out, take out the effect of our motion. And here's what's left over. This is now data taken from the, the best measurement to date, which is from the Planck satellite launched by the European Space Agency. So this is just really in the last year, this data. And we've observed it at several uh, frequencies or several wavelengths going from the relatively low 30 gigahertz. So that's something that is used for even communications here on planet Earth all the way up to these very high frequencies, which you can only see out in space. And what you can see is uh, the Milky Way galaxy um, and emission from dust. It turns out you get spinning dust grains in space, possibly lined up by magnetic fields, and they radiate at these frequencies. There's quite a lot of pattern, especially down at the higher frequencies. It tends to dominate what's going on. Have I mentioned how much I hate dust? Once or twice, Brian, once yeah. or twice. So what you have is this dust, and you have synchrotron radiation from just electrons and magnetic fields interacting in the Milky Way. And in fact, you get quasars contributing and all sorts of other things yeah. like that. But by observing in these nine different frequencies, you can go through and you can model everything. And it turns out everything in the sky is what we think is to be some sort of power law. That is, the log of the flux is proportional to the log of the wavelength, except for black body radiation, which has the curve of Planck's uh, radiation law. So the microwave background is a blank body spectrum, whereas pretty much everything else is a power law. So what you can do is you can try and work out what the power law slope is for this sort of dust, that sort of dust, for the quasars, for the synchrotron emission. And by combining all the different wavelengths, you can then fit these power laws, take them off, and see what's left over. Yes, yeah, so you take off the power laws and you leave the black body. Now this is not easy. No. And it's somewhat controversial because they're probably not pure power laws, there'll be different power laws, and indeed the debate is currently raging about the BICEP2 results, whether it's real or whether it's an error in subtracting off all these other things and going on. And even in this group, there are groups that are complaining about the map here at 217 gigahertz as being a little, you know, not quite right, and so has that made tiny little deviations in the map we're going to show you now. But if we take our current best guess at subtracting all these things off, you end up with something that looks like this. So what we see here are little bumps and wiggles. And these bumps and wiggles turn out to be sound waves, sound waves that are very, very long relative to the ones we hear. And you will see that there are great big cool areas and very large warm areas. But then there's this little tiny modeling pattern, which turns out to have a very specific uh, size on the sky. And what you can actually do is measure what the sizes are of the characteristic lumps here. So this is saying, if you've got a, a high bit on the sky, and you look a bit away from it, is it also likely to be high or is it likely to be low? And if you plot that, you get something like this. So what you're plotting here is angular size versus lumpiness. Yep, so this is a, a lump, a lumpometer effectively. And so where you have lumps of a given size, let's say all the lumps in the sky are exactly one size, There'd then be a big peak at that there size, would be one peak else. at that size. And so what we see is there's a lot of lumps, and that's that characteristic modeledness, is here at about one degree. But then there are ones here at roughly two or, you know, a half a degree and yeah, two tenths of a degree. On the bottom here. Yep and smaller and smaller. So if we were to zoom in on this, it turns out you can see almost 15 little lumpy peaks. And those, it turns out, are sort of the harmonics of the universe, if you'd like to think of it. Yes, that. and we'll talk about the physics of those in a bit. Uh, maybe a bit of a digression how you actually measure lumpiness as a function of scale. And this is analogous to spectrum analysis in, say, music. Let's say we have a note, la. Um, you can break it up into its component frequencies. Uh, so what you're doing is you're taking the actual waveform of the sound and breaking it up into sine waves. And it turns out any periodic 
function at all can be broken up into a bunch of sine waves. In this case, it's not just a straight line, it's on a sphere. But there's something similar you can do in a sphere, which is um, breaking it up into spherical harmonics, as they're called. Um, so what you can do, this is the first order spherical harmonics, yep. which is just uniform for the sky. Second order, which would be high and low, or high and low and high and low. It turns out any pattern that's only on scales of your 90 degrees can be made up by some combination of these three. Yep. And then you get smaller scales still, where now you've got four, two bright and two dark patches on the sky. And once again, any pattern with two bright and two dark can be made up by some combination of these five. And you can keep on going to higher and higher order, and you get all these patterns, the spherical harmonics, which allow you to reproduce any pattern by adding together enough of these. So, to give you an example, we like to call this one the dipole. Okay? So the dipole, it turns out, using these shapes, we can perfectly reproduce that cosine shape on the sky of our motion. Turns out we can use that completely to describe that. But when you have something more complicated on it, we have to go to higher and higher orders of these, these things. These would be called quadrupoles, yes. and then octopoles, octopoles and, and so on. all sorts of things beyond that. And so the, the, the game is, is you go through and you make the shape on the sky out of these shapes. And you will notice that these shapes, for those of you who can go back to your chemistry days, they look a lot like the orbitals that uh, an atom has where an electron is allowed to be. And indeed, they are essentially the same functions. Mm -hmm. And if you can remember from those days, you have something known as the L value. So this would be L equal 1, L equal 2, L equal 3, L equal 4. And you have the M values, which is these ones here, plus or minus 1, etc. Plus or minus 2, plus or minus blah, blah, blah. And this is actually how you measure these things. What you do is you take the pattern on the sky and break it down into its multipole components. And so, for example, there isn't any one because that would just be the uniform brightness. But this point here is two. This is the, the dipole. And it's hard to measure because you have to take off the dipole of our own motion. Yes. And then this will be order number, uh, the next order down, three, so then four and five and six and so on. And that's how they actually break it down into how much lumpiness there is on different scales. We're looking at how strong the different multiples are when you do a multiple breakdown. And again, all the way up to multiples in year 2,500 or so. And with balloon experiments and South Pole experiments, they can go to even higher multiples, and that looks at the really small scale structure. The really tiny stuff. And so there's fancy mathematical techniques that turn out to be very powerful using this. That's why we use it. But ultimately, this is telling us that if we want to break things down, we're going to be able to describe that lumpiness of the universe of having essentially this one degree scale of these, uh, these spherical harmonics. OK, so let's see if we can actually explain the physics of where these characteristic spikes actually come from.